Hey folks, Joseph Sabora here. Happy Halloween. Gather around with your favorite costumes to go trick-or-treating at, door to door. Hang around at a very haunting Halloween party. And just have the best time of your lives. So I was thinking for this particular holiday season, I decided to do one more of a movie review. And this time around, it's a CGI animated sci-fi comedy that came out on March 27th, 2009, which, believe it or not, was the very first animated feature from DreamWorks that was shot in 3D. But they also have the 2D version as well. And that is Monsters vs. Aliens. Yes. Which is a story about a government that hires the US Armed Force, so that includes the President of the United States, to take a group of misfit monsters to battle an alien invasion that's occurring in the Bay Area. So you have Dynormica, the 50-foot woman, who was, of course, uh, a young woman, uh, joining in with a brilliant scientist, Dr. Cockroach, PhD. You got this macho fish like creature named uh, the Missing Link. You have this uh, crystal blue uh, gelatin like creature, Bob, or BOB. <laughs> and you also have this uh, 350 foot tall grub named Insectosaurus. And of course right next to it is this robotic um, probe that was been sent by the aliens that was actually run by a squid-like alien by the name of Galazar. Yes. And this is the Blu-ray release I picked up um, at Best Buy back in 2009 when it was released. Unfortunately, though, I had to buy this uh, originally when I got uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs for a lot more, but then during Black Friday I thought maybe this would be a good idea to exchange it for, for $10 so that way I can get this for a lot cheaper. And I figured, why not? <laughs> this would be perfect. So that's what I did. And this is a very nice set. Uh, it does come with features, including the at the time, an all-new adventure, Bob's Big Break. Uh, it's a short film. It's in 3D, but there's also a 2D included. And it has 3D glasses inside. Yeah, hasn't been opened, but I'm going to keep it that way. Um, but here's the disc. It's in gray. <laughs> okay. So yes, it has Blu-ray exclusives, uh, the Animator's Corner, along with the Trivia Track, and then you got the Ginormous Extras, uh, the Karaoke Music Party with your favorite monsters singing the hits of any kind. Yeah, one was I Will Survive for Janumica. Um He had uh, <laughs> More Than the Woman that was sung by Bob, and you also have uh, Dr. Cockroach and the missing link singing the song born to be wild <laughs> i love those you got three never before seen deleted scenes uh, most of which are just done by storyboards and all uh, you got the paddle ball game and monsters 3d the top secret sneak peek files which shows uh, the next 3d adventure from dreamworks animation which that turned out to be how to train your dragon um, Shrek's Broadway musical debut, yeah, that was coming out. Uh, Pose uh, Kung Fu Panda Virtual World, really cool. The Modern Monster Movie Making, yeah, that's just a featurette. You know, how they did all that, and and several others to join. <laughs> so, it's a very nice set, and it's incredible. And it definitely plays perfectly on my 4K player, too. <laughs> as well as my other Blu-ray player. I hope this gets a 4K pretty soon. I I think they, this would be perfect for all Dreamers films to come out in this format. And maybe they'll include the 3D version to join in too. 
because they did release this on Blu-ray 3D as well. So hopefully you'll find it. <laughs> they did actually spawn out um, two television specials. It was uh, Mutant Pumpkins from Outer Space, and then the other one is called Night of the Living Carrots. <laughs> and they did have a TV series that aired on Nickelodeon, which sadly only lasted for one season. I never saw the series, though, unfortunately. I wish I did, because I would have loved to. But And again, that's Nickelodeon. You know, they always like to focus on their, their usual live-action shows and other shows like Spongebob and all that, so that's the problem. But it was a ginormous hit, uh, well, sort of. I mean, it, it did, um, out of its uh, $175 million budget, which also uh, joins in with $15 million budget to coincide uh, with Hewitt Packard and Intel joining in to create Intru 3D, it actually made 381.5 million worldwide. So I think they could have been this close to making the sequel for that particular amount. But maybe they would have doubled even more. Time I had to see this movie in a theater in 3D. Of course, before this I saw Coraline. And before that I saw all those other movies to talk about. But Because I know we were in the this decade where we were getting several 3D movies to come out, even all these new ones, but we were getting them uh, later on too, and they're still releasing films in 3D, even in this this particular stage that we're in today. <laughs> well, you get the idea. Um, anyway, but I actually saw this twice in theaters. Uh, first, I had to see it in 2D because I want to see how the experience looked because I love the animation. You know, DreamWorks does provide a lot of excellent animation in both 2D and 3D, especially the CGI animation that they have done. But this was is incredible, very amazing too. But then I had to see it um, again, but this time on my birthday uh, with my father. So we went to go see it at Man Feeders in Glendale, and they were playing it in 3D, so I wanted to have that experience. And <laughs> when, when this came out, and having to see it on the big screen in 3D, it was just incredible. Um, the one I remember the most was when having to see uh, the scene of uh, General Warden R. Monger, who was of course played by Kiefer Sullivan, who's flying around in a jetpack, you know, flying around with all the monsters around inside the facility. And it, it's amazing because I can even touch it too. <laughs> well, not really, but it, I just had to put my hands in it while having to watch this uh, through my lenses. And oh wow, it was just incredible. And, and this is exactly how a 3D film should look like. And this was in the tradition of all the, the 50s and 60s sci-fi movies that we were getting. In fact, I mean, this is a take on films like Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, um, along with The Fly, The Curse of Frankenstein, The Blob, The Crawling Eye, and Mafra, and even Creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> so it's almost like, uh, it would have been like if, if we did actually had a universe where we have all these monsters teaming up together to battle against all the aliens that are invading, you know, like any other kind of aliens that we had from outer space. <laughs> so this was incredible how they did it for, and I keep saying the word incredible, only to be said uh, in the Bay Area like San Francisco, uh, Fresno, or Odessa. <laughs> just perfect. And it brought in an excellent talented cast of any choices that you love, providing a lot of movie, movie references, you know, like E.T., Close Encounters of the Fur Kind, and you know, Doctor Strange Love, and all those other kind of movies that you're familiar with. So it just works. So let's begin. <laughs> Starts Reese Witherspoon, uh, the beautiful, talented, 
Turkish uh, actress who's done a lot of great work with films like The Man in the Moon, as well as A Far Off Place, uh, Election, Pleasantville, Four Christmases, and Wild, among many others. Seth Rogen has been in comedies like Super Bad, This Is the End, A Knock Up, uh, among others. <laughs> Hugh Laurie, who was from the Bowers, as well as 101 Dalmatians, the live action remake. He was even in the TV series House MD. <laughs> yeah. War on Net from Saturday Night Live, but he's done several voice acting and some comedies that he has. Uh, Comrade Burnin, who's also the director of the film. Wayne Wilson from The Office. <laughs> Yeah, the, the American version with uh, Steve Carell, <laughs> along with the rest. Amy Poehler, also from Saturday Night Live. Uh, Kiefer Sullivan, from 24, and many films that he's done in his career, like Young Guns, Renegades, uh, Mirrors, and all those other ones that he's done. Uh, Stephen Colbert. Yep, the comedian who now has his own talk show that's on Late Night on CBS. Uh, but he was on the, the Daily Show a long time ago on Comedy Central. Paul Rudd, yes, which I find it interesting because both Witherspoon and Rudd were in a movie together called Overnight Delivery. But of course, Paul Rudd's been in a lot of stuff, you know. He was in the 40-year-old version, also with Seth Rogen. <laughs> he was in um, Clueless. Yes, he was in Halloween 6. And he was in Ant-Man, along with the sequel. <laughs> of course. Jeffrey Tambor from Heavyweights. Freeze Company. The Ropers. Uh, Max Headroom. The Larry Sanders Show. Hellboy, among others. Uh, Julie White, which I know she was in the Transformers, yeah, the live-action Transformers as Judy Whit Whitwicky. Uh, she was also in the TV show Grace Under Fire and all. Uh, Winnie Zellweger, of course, very cute actress who was in movies like Jerry Maguire, B Movie, uh, as well as um, Empire Records. John Kukwinski, yes, also from The Office, but he went on to uh, direct the movie and also stars in uh, A Quiet Place, you know, with his wife, uh, Emily Blunt. <laughs> and Ed Helms, also from The Office. <laughs> so yeah, we got some Office veterans in the same movie. <laughs> I love that. But we also got a mix of all the other actors here. Okay, it's written by uh, Maya Forbes Wallace uh, Wodarski, sorry, uh, along with Rob Letterman, Conrad Burnin, of course, they both direct, with Jonathan Abel and Glenn Berger. And once again, I'm going to say it again, it's directed by Conrad Burnin and Rob Letterman. The movie began set in outer space after a planet has been destroyed possibly being zapped by aliens that created a meteorite that heads directly towards Earth into a small city called Modesto, California, where we meet a young, perkish, very sweet Susan Murphy, who's ready to get married to a handsome news weatherman, Derek Dettel. So they gather around with their friends and family, and all the rest of the guests to go head off to the chapel on their wedding day. Of course, before the ceremony begins, um, well, they weren't supposed to see each other until after they're ready to get married. Uh, they were talking about some plans that had to be occurred, mostly for Derek, because we learned that he's becoming the next general manager at the local TV station, so then he's going to go coast to coast. So they're going to move to Fresno. 
maybe they have a honeymoon over there for a while or so because uh, their plan was they wanted to go to Paris on their honeymoon night but but hopefully they'll be able to have a chance to do so so Susan apparently agrees until she was hit by a meteorite uh, from the planet that fell from the sky she got knocked unconscious uh, for a little while and then she's woken up and then soon as it begins for the wedding its radiation causes her to go green yeah she was glowing her right throughout her entire body and started to grow into a ginormous size of 50 feet which is, destroys the entire uh, wedding chapel, already collapsed. The rest of the guests had escaped, but Derek suddenly got knocked by uh, several planks of wood, but Susan eventually tries to save him before the U.S. military had came by using tranquilizers to detach um, Susan and captures her completely. Now she's being awakened in the top secret government facility where he features a subgroup group of monsters that they found, mostly a few. And that's where we meet Dr. Cockroach, PhD, who is a scientist who became half human, half cockroach after the experiment had gone completely wrong. Then we have um, Bob, you know, or B.O.B.s, which stands for Benazoid, Oscazeni, Barbcarbonate, yeah, which is basically a crystal blue gelatin-like creature who's brainless, but he just lives with a whole mass of, of goo, of food flavoring. But he was trying to, you know, find some intelligence here and there. We also have the missing link, who is a macho, prehistoric. Uh, 20 million year old uh, fish ape who just you know loves to scare who loves to hang around at Cocoa Beach and all that he was thinking about but he was uh, he was a hybrid that was frawled from the deep ice by scientists around and we also got a massive bug um, grub he was 350 350 feet in height that was created in Tokyo named Insectosaurus. So of course Susan is now being known as Dynormica that was named by the government and she's been forbidden to make any contact with her friends and family including her husband already feeling very isolated and lonely. So now we meet this one squid-like uh, extraterrestrial villain named Galaxar that came from a mysterious spaceship in deep space <laughs> already alerting the presence of Quantornium that came from a powerful energy source on Earth that was created from the planet that's being zapped and he actually sends a robotic probe to retrieve it so of course the probe had later landed on Earth I guess it's sort of taking on on the movie The Day That Earth Stood Still. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that one too. That's where we meet the President of the United States. Yeah, it's sort of a goofy type, but you get the idea. Um, but he attempts to make his first contact. I mean, first it was going to be the Close Encounters theme, but instead it was the Axel F theme from Beverly Hills Cop. <laughs> Uh, you know, do 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 But then the probe had went on a rampage and already with the rest of the military about to attack the the probe, but no such use. And then of course the president was going to shoot at his gun, but that didn't work either. So he left directly into the helicopter. So it's heading straight to San Francisco, but despite of all the unsuccessful attempts to destroy this probe, that's when the armed forces decided to uh, hire the group of monsters, hoping that they will be able to destroy it completely by uh, 
General uh, W.F. Monger. So yes, he convinced the president to to release the monsters for their freedom so they can stop the probe and they can become heroes themselves. So at this rate in San Francisco, the robot had detect, yeah, detect the quaternium radiation through Jarnormica's body and tries to take it from her. So of course, Jarnormica was ready to stop this probe uh, directly into the the skylines of San Francisco, which has already been empty. Uh, there's a scene where she was about to escape from the probe, and then she was about to jump all the way through, running towards these rooftops, and was about to grab the the roof. But it's she slips, but then <laughs> she fell. But only she realized that yeah, she's a giant, so at least she doesn't have to fall down. <laughs> she could just stand. <laughs> so of course. She, had, she was about to escape from the probe. You know, she runs around like, like she was on roller skates, you know, by using those two cars that are empty. And just rolling around directly into the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, where Dr. Cockroach, uh, along with um, the Missing Link and uh, Bob, were about to go after her and hoping that they will be able to stop the probe. And, of course, even the... Insectosaurus had came along to to help, you know, with Dinormica trying to stop the probe, but he's trying to get all the people, you know, through and the entire traffic of cars, trucks, and and all out of out of the way, you know, once the the bridge has been destroyed, and once uh, so she pretty much did all the work in a way. She she did stop the probe. Insectosaurus uh, helped in too, but they sort of tried to help, but, but there was no such use. But at, at the end of the day, they they finally defeat the probe, and now they're ready to go for their, I guess, their next mission or so. Which that's going to lead to what's going on when Galaxar sets a course for Earth to obtain the plutonium in person. While the now free Genormica returns home with her new friends and reunites with her family, and hoping he'll she'll be able to see um, Derek again, which unfortunately um, leads to a breakup. Decided not to see each other again because it's not exactly how sh how it's going to work out. Which I know he turns into a self righteous jerk. So at that point on, the Ginormica has been captured by Galazar, so he can be able to steal the Quantonium from her. So it does reduce back to her normal size. And she's being captured by, which he just made a clone of himself, uh, an army full of uh, cloned uh, Galazars. So that's where it's going to start the alien invasion as planned. So he'll be able to destroy Earth. But it was up to uh, the monsters to save uh, Ginormica and also to have them team up together to stop all the aliens and destroy the entire spaceship. And she'll be able to get her power back too, to go back to becoming a giant. And I guess she'll be able to get used to this, you know going forward uh, between her old life and her new life. So at this rate, she's going to go on her next mission along with the, the monsters that's being signed up by Monger. Which is going to be heading off at uh, Paris, which this is exactly what she wanted. So apparently she's going to save the world over there. And also because she did dump um, Derek after, you know, Derek... Um, apologize to her after what he acted but I guess he just wanted to use her coast to coast anyway but of course Derek's gonna come and he'll be able to broadcast live coast to coast directly to Paris so on their next mission and the film ends this way it is an amazing hilarious um, very fun um, 
CGI animated sci-fi comedy that really works in the tradition of all the sci-fi movies that we had. Um, the animation is incredible. There are hilarious gags and moments in the movie, and I'm going to mention it right away. It was when they had the, the shrieking woman keep screaming constantly anytime the general was showing all the clips of the monsters just to introduce to everyone. But they told her to shut up, and then the last scream turned out to be <laughs> the president. Um, another scene here was when they were having a party at Susan's house, you know, to Normica, while she was away, you know, trying to see Derek at the studio. Um, yeah, Dr. Cockroach was eating garbage. Bob was uh, making contact with the gelatin, and <laughs> the, the link is just diving into the swimming pool where he got all this chlorine on his eyes, and they're acting like they're they're being scared off with all the rest of the guests and. Susan's parents. So it turned out to be quite of a disaster in a way. <laughs> or even when they were in the Galazar spaceship too, you know, already with all the, the army full of clones, where <laughs> the, they were already in disguises too, and, and they're about to kill all these other ones. Uh, there's even a moment for Dr. Cockroach to actually self-destruct and trying to um, disarm it by going through this uh, Dance Dance Revolution Simon type uh, of motherboard that they have <laughs> you know, with all the directions that he knows of and but apparently it started to self-destruct into six minutes <laughs> oh wow excellent uh, talented cast that we got. You know, Reese Witherspoon definitely provided the, the voice acting of Susan perfectly. You know, she's Normica. She, she's definitely um, gives it a perkish persona in her character. She's very sweet. You definitely felt bad for her after she became the giant, but next thing you know, she, she has new friends and she'll be able to team up together and in case there's any more trouble heading around the entire uh, city or any other. But she did have super strength, um, physical imperviousness. She has a lot of vulnerability that's ahead of her. And, and she's, I guess I had to say this, she's very hot. <laughs> very beautiful. Either with white hair or red hair that she has. Um, as for the characters of the monsters, um, yeah, the B.O.B. is, or Bob, is um, definitely funny at times. I mean, gives that particular persona that he has, too, with all the hilarious stints. I mean, considering how brainless he is, but sometimes he can be smart. But, of course, he does make contact with uh, a gelatin. <laughs> Yeah, he's Jello. Uh, the missing link uh, is definitely Macho, right? You know, he wants to scare off um, all the humans, and of course, he wants to go back to Cocoa Beach, Florida, where he belongs. You know, just to hang around. Uh, Doctor Cockroach is definitely um, highly intelligent. I mean, he can do anything that he wants, no matter even though he has the ability of a cockroach. <laughs> Insectosaurus, I mean, for this particular giant, I mean, he can really shoot silk out of his nose. Um, of course, he can even turn into a butterfly, too, <laughs> uh, which is towards the end. That was part of the twist. But does have a close bond with Link, too, to understand what he's talking about. Uh, I know there was a character called the Invisible Man, which unfortunately it was only shown in the shorts, but I guess that was sort of a... We, we began to find out whatever happened to him. <laughs> um, Galgzar is definitely uh, an, a very evil but brilliant alien villain who just wants to steal all the Quantitonium 
you know, which is the one that transforms Susan into a giant. So that way he'll be able to use it for his other plans, maybe to zap uh, all the planets around and take over, create his own army of clones of himself, so they invade. Uh, of course, uh, we also have Galdazar's computer, which you get to hear the voice of Amy Poehler in this very cutesy voice of hers, but it's kind of sound like all the other uh, voice communicators that you can have. Uh, General Warren R. Monger, yes, the tough military leader is perfect. I mean, because, of course, he begins to hell all the monsters inside the top secret facility, hoping, you know, maybe they'll spend some time, but unless there's another mission going around, this will be his choice to send them out to, to go after all these creatures. But he's perfect, and plus he gets to fly around in the jetpack that he has too. I mean he also uses the jetpacks for the monsters when they came to the rescue. And, and of course we get all the the friends and family to join around here and there. Even the President of the United States, uh, you know, voiced by Stephen Colbert, you know, who's who's pretty much not exactly himself at this point. I mean he always keeps forgetting that the button that he was about to press was gonna be for the espresso, but Turn, but I know the other button was basically where it's going to launch missiles <laughs> and all this other stuff that's going around. Um, very funny movie, and I love it. I, I'm glad I saw it, and watching it uh, on Blu ray is incredible. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, uh, the, this movie was actually going to start out as an adaptation of a horror comic book called Rex Havoc, so I know they were going to use some of the characters that would soon become this movie. So I guess it just didn't work out as, as it seems. So, But it did took uh, several years to figure that out. Yeah. So anyway. Um, but you're going to love this movie. And, and it's definitely worth watching this on Halloween. Especially if you're watching this along with, as a double feature with the two Hall Halloween specials, uh, Mutant Pumpkins from Outer Space and Night of the Living Carrots, uh, come to mind. Um, this is worth it. I do wish there was a sequel. This would have been perfect. I mean, with all the, the money that they made for this movie, this would have been perfect for another sequel. I would have loved to see their next adventure. But I guess you had to watch the TV series to find that out, or just watch the other ones. That's a shame, because it would have been perfect too. But no, DreamWorks had to continue to do sequels to films like The Boss's Baby and, and Trolls. Yeah, and those two films are overrated. Garbage, and I don't care about those movies. I care for films like Monster vs. Aliens, B-Movie, Ants, the Shrek movies, except for the third film. Yeah, put some Boots. Make him mine, and and some of the other good ones that we had. <laughs> yeah, that's what I care for. So anyway, that's Monsters vs. Aliens, and I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. And, of course, have a happy Halloween. <laughs>